has been away for some time because she was awarded a very prestigious uh, research fellowship, leadership fellowship, and that's, I think, where some of your recent research was developed. And the project was called Dynamic Tensions, New Masculinities in the Performance of Fitness. And I think you have, over the years, had a strong engagement of sport, uh, fitness, and also you yourself are a qualified weightlifting coach. Um, your recent performances involved both elements of sport but also of labor. And Roderick is a senior lecturer here and of course has published on issues of performance and labor. But um, what we are seeing today uh, appears to be um, shifting also slightly to the pleasure side, which is a very exciting uh, pro uh, prospect. And I, uh, not having really been in California, don't know this muscle beach mm -hmm. that you will be addressing, but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing you speak about it. Also, the period seems to be 30s to 40s to 50s, a uh, period that uh, would be very interesting historically for, for us to hear about. So please welcome uh, Broderick Chow, and um, I present him to you for his lecture on idle training. Um, thanks very much. This is a, it's, really, it's nice to present on at this point in the project, which is really kind of coming to the end of um, two years worth of uh, research and study on um, a kind of history of performance of physical culture through the lens of theater history. Um, and this talk today comes from the final chapter of the book. So there's something very um, it feels very final, even though what I'm going to be talking about is the delaying of, of the end, I suppose. So there's something quite elegiac about it, um, and reading through it, it seems like things are ending. Um, but uh, in fact, I'm going back to, to Texas, to the site of where a lot of this research started um, next week. So, so some of that, so it's not really an end, but you know, a part of a, a longer process. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm talking mainly about Muscle Beach, um, a site in ca uh, California and Santa Monica. I want to start with another text, so that happens m much later in the same area of Southern California. So this is a film from 1968 um, called San Diego Surf, which was made by Andy Warhol and a group of his uh, factory regulars. So in 1968, um, this group of artists, they moved into a house in La Jolla, California to make this film. Um, but California's very uh, essence, its essence of idleness defeated these uh, hardworking New Yorkers. So after three weeks, everybody basically got bored and they abandoned the film and it was left unfinished until 1995. In 95, the Warhol Commission, uh, Warhol Foundation commissioned Paul Morrissey, um, his longtime collaborator, to finish editing it. But even still, it wasn't premiered um, until 2012 um, at the Museum of Modern Art. So the film concerns a married couple who are played by uh, regulars to the factory, Viva and Taylor Mead. Uh, and this married couple rents a beach house with a, uh, to a group of surfers. So they're, they, they live in... in La Jolla, and they rent it to these surfers. Um, then follows 90 pretty much plotless minutes. And finally, in a two minute scene in the end, the film culminates in the surfer Tom Homperts giving a golden shower to Taylor Mead. The scene was actually shot weeks later in New York because uh, Paul Morrissey says there wasn't enough movie there. The film's boringness, I think, is part of the point. It emphasizes an idle eroticism, a heightened arousal that never actually culminates in intercourse, nor does it really seem to want to. So what is the point of the film? The point really seems to be the camera's lingering gaze on these buffed and bronzed male bodies, especially this guy, Tom Hompertz, an Illinois transplant whose blonde, shaggy hair and lean musculature makes him seem the epitome of the California golden boy. Warhol's camera, of course, was no stranger to the beautiful male body, particularly Joe D'Alessandro, who appears in San Diego Surf, but as well as Lonesome Cowboys, Trash, and Flesh, and more famous movies. Before meeting Andy Warhol, Joe D'Alessandro posed for Bob Miser, the legendary photographer of male flesh and the found founder of Athletic Model Guild, a physique photography studio that was, of course, also a landmark moment in gay pornography and visual culture. The connections, I think, between 
Joe D'Alessandro, Bob Miser, and Andy Warhol reveal another scene of idle pleasure that I want to suggest San Diego Serpents unconsciously referencing, the original Muscle Beach that existed in Santa Monica, California from 1934 to 1958, and which closed 10 years before um, San Diego Surf was shot. The original Muscle Beach isn't to be confused with the outdoor gym in Venice Beach, which most people call Muscle Beach now, and which was made famous by Arnold Schwarzenegger, among others. This is the original Muscle Beach. It was home to a number of male and female athletes who passed their time training in weightlifting, gymnastics, and high-flying adagio and hand balancing. So it was at this beach in the 1950s that Bob Miser got his start opening up a photography studio and capturing images of the men who invented the American beefcake, these guys, Ed Fury, Armand Tanny, and Richard Harrison. Ten years after the closure of Muscle Beach, um, Tom Hompert's Joe D'Alessandro and the San Diego surf performers engage in a kind of surrogation of a forgotten moment, celebration of a forgotten and utopian moment of lingering, waiting, and playing. So in the limited public scholarship on this beach, Muscle Beach is supposedly the birthplace of the American fitness movement. Its image is kind of squeaky clean, all-American, resolutely heterosexual, golden boys and girls engaged in healthy exercise in the Californian sunshine. But I wanted to start with this genealogy of War Andy Warhol, Bob Miser, and Muscle Beach to point out uh, a disavowed and but often deeply intertwined relationship of physical fitness, pornography, and art, um, the study of which seems often really resistant to interdisciplinarity. So tracing what came after Muscle Beach to a queer pornographic and artistic production suggests another way of reading this historical moment outside of heteronormative bonds as a queer performance, as bodies inventing new ways of living and being together. So Muscle Beach originated in the Great Depression, a period when unemployment of Cal in California had reached 28%. So one-fifth of Californians were dependent on public assistance. In this context, I think that our images of Muscle Beach index a kind of unhurried, deferred pleasure, more about hanging out than hooking up. It's a kind of idle pleasure that takes place in enforced free time. And this performance um, or form of living is uh, akin to what Giulia Palladini conceives of as foreplay. So I use this concept, um, concept a lot later on. So Giulia Palladini uses the concept of foreplay from sexual term terminology to mark labors of pleasure that project forward towards a climax yet hesitate or avoid that climax because it would bring an end to the foreplay. So these high-risk and very dangerous activities of perfected bodies on Muscle Beach aim to arouse the attention of an audience at the same time that they suggest an embodied arousal which is sustained and circulated by the performers themselves. But the Muscle Beach uh, athletes never translated this pastime into production, so they never created, uh, transformed their leisure into work. In the linear narrative of creative production, the transformation of amateur labor into professional is usually the climax, so that's what we want. We want to go become professionals. But as with the orgasm in intercourse, such a climax would bring an end to the act as such, that is to say, the experimentations of the bodies on the beach would be over. So the sustained experimentation with physical relations points to a polymorphous politics outside of structures of family or civic duty. So how did Muscle Beach start? In 1934, um, three gymnasts from Santa Monica High School, Paul Brewer, Al Niederman, and Jimmy Pfeiffer, began practicing gymnastics on Muscle Beach, which wasn't called that at the time. It was a Santa Monica Pier. Other athletes have been practicing on this beach since the 1920s, but it was with the influence of these boys, as well as Paul's sister, Relna Brewer, Coach Randall Hall, and acrobat Johnny Collins, that this community began forming. Um, there were several other factors that contributed to Muscle Beach. Um, the historian Jan Todd notes that um, there was the 1932 Olympic Games in Los Angeles, which spurred interest in gymnastics. The 1933 earthquake in Long Beach, which damaged the high school and council plans to build an actual boys gymnasium so people were forced outside. As well as probably the most important was the ongoing influence of the Great Depression. The athletes originally practiced on tarps and carpets, but in 1936, with the support of UCLA gymnastics coach Cecil Hollingsworth, the city granted very reluctant 
permission for Niederman to build a three by 12 inch platform, 12 foot platform, um, which also included gymnastic rings and parallel bars. So the platform was basically just this slab of wood on the beach. But what happened at this point was that it created a stage for the athletes. And it began to institutionalize Muscle Beach's particular economy of attention. So the site took on a dual function as a training facility as well as a performance space. The athletes' training was performance. Their work on the self was a spectacle for the audiences. Audiences would gather on the pier, eating hot dogs and cotton candy, watching bodies in motion, performing gymnastics, adagio, and weightlifting. Um, it was free entertainment during the Great Depression, which was something that Americans needed in those days. So in other words, the athlete's unpaid labor was sustained by the attention of the audience, but also by something internal to these bodies in practice. So they wanted to do it. It was a sense of community, friendship, or what I want to later on call a sense of queer kinship. So by 1938, the number of people involved had risen up to 50 regulars um, who would come mainly every day. And the group's training sessions on the weekends began to attract huge crowds of, of, of hundreds of people. Um, and interestingly, the beach carried on during the Second World War, which makes it seem weirdly out of time. The war years often function as a kind of cut or a historical marker, so we say pre-war and post-war, but the fact that Muscle Beach's periodization goes from 34 to 58 makes it seem like it's um, a utopia that wasn't affected by, by the war. But of course it was, because many of the men of Muscle Beach went off to, to fight in the war. Uh, they began became conscripted as physical training instructors for the army, um, and during this time, the beach was sustained by the women. After the war, bodybuilders from across the country, including future Mr. America winners Steve Reeves and George Eiferman, moved to Santa Monica specifically to train at Muscle Beach. In 1947, the Mr. and Miss Muscle Beach physique contest began to be staged, but in 1958, the Santa Monica City Council unceremoniously closed the beach and overnight, without any warning, they bulldozed the platform and the equipment. It was moral concerns that led to this council decision. So for years, so for 24 years, the bodybuilders, weightlifters and, weightlifters and gymnasts had held a very uneasy relationship with the city. The Santa Monica Evening Outlook um, dubbed them in 1959 um, the, the newspaper called them sexual athletes and queers. The tipping point in most historical accounts was a case involving five members of the American Olympic weightlifting team who were accused of statutory rape of two underage African American girls. The charges were dismissed, but as many have pointed out, the race of the alleged victims may have been a limiting factor in the court's efforts to prosecute the case. But by this time, already many of the regulars had married and moved away settling into coupled lives elsewhere, fixing this image of a temporary utopia in the sand of sexual athletes and queers in memory. The Muscle Beach athletes barely made money. So in 1948, an article for the Los Angeles Times, which was titled, uh, Muscle Men Understood Over Financial Careers, um, stated, quote, the truth is, the financial careers of beautiful specimens of weightlifters are sketchy. George Eiferman himself said he didn't have any def anything definite in sight, but would be interested in teaching physical culture or a movie contract or even wrestling." End quote. So when he was asked over 50 years later how these regulars made money, Eiferman replied, well, exhibitions, talks, there were certain fees we charge, modest fees to make a living. So this was very common. Many athletes would make appearances at physical culture shows, high school assemblies, and in Hollywood as stuntmen, but of course also posing for beefcake photographers like Bob Miser. Um, Pudgy Stockton, uh, Pudgy is the nickname of Abby Stockton, uh, Pudgy Stockton, who had a day job working at the telephone company, describes trying to book split shifts in order to spend the entire day at the beach. It was only in 1940 when Vic Tanny opened a gym in Santa Monica that the athletes came to have a semi-regular income, as many of them could work and train there. Irregular gigs and shifts at his gym sustained the athletes enough that they could maintain the daily business of idly training at the beach. So Steve Reeves, by far the most successful Muscle Beach alumni, in a 2000 interview describes a scene. He'd said, he says, quote, I get up in the morning, I don't know, about seven, because I don't 
like to sleep too late anyways and go to the beach. Just hang around for a little bit, then go to the gym and work out for a couple hours, we'll say 8 to 10, then back to the beach for the rest of the day. The gang would survive on a dollar a day for food, cottage cheese and tuna, with occasional trips to the Roundup, a buffet restaurant, which was all you can eat for a buck and a half. Reeves, uh, George Eiferman, and many others lived at what was called Muscle House, the home of Joy Cortez, a woman in her 70s who opened her home to bodybuilders and gymnasts, uh, very similar to the bourgeois couple that was played uh, by Taylor Mead and Viva and Sam um, In contrast, after Muscle Beach closed, George Eiferman was offered $100 uh, per month to train at a facility in York, Pennsylvania with uh, weightlifting coach Bob Hoffman. So there was financial stability for athletes elsewhere, but Muscle Beach was sustained by a genuine desire and love, a temporary utopia in the sand. At the same time, uh, Muscle Beach sported another unpaid economy of attention. Training sessions gradually became daily spectacles for audiences. This short documentary by Joseph Strick um, captures this economy. It's shot in black and white, and the film intersperses shots of primary activities in Muscle Beach with close-ups of the audience's gaze. We see athletes performing tricks on Muscle Beach, um, per, uh, gymnastics rings, parallel bars, balance beams. A man and a woman perform an adagio dance on the carpet. A young man sketches other young men sunbathing. Children play in the surf and on playground equipment and watch young men and women working out with weights. A woman with bare legs and striped blouse performs a deadlift in front of a group of suited men. A man performs bicep curls while the audience looks on from behind him. The longest section of this nine minute documentary is devoted to hand balancing and adagio acts and we see some of the endless combinations of bodies characteristic of the most famous Muscle Beach photos. I'm going to skip to that. A woman balances a man in high hand-to-hand. -hand. A man balances another man by the feet who holds another man by the hips. Feet to hips, hands to chest, shoulders to toes, to hands to toes. Count one, breathe, then up. Hand balancing and adagio owed their popularity to the visiting vaudevillians. Um, with the decline of vaudeville in the 1920s, out-of-work acts passed their time on Muscle Beach and brought the partner balancing and graceful poses of adagio to the athletes there who innovated on and adapted the technique. So one of the most famous routines in adagio dance is the apash, which is meant to simulate a physical fight between a pimp and a prostitute. And the, the word apache is the French pronunciation of Apache, as Holly has pointed out. Um, the, it doesn't come, it, it has nothing to do with Native American culture, it was just French. Well, it was a tribe, the, I mean not a tribe, a gang, in, 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 um, the, in right. from 1905 in Paris. Who adopted the term because of the perceived savagery of, of Native Americans. Yeah. Okay. So the outpost is meant to simulate a physical fight between a pimp and a prostitute. The outpost of the Dazio of dancers Alexis and Durano here was filmed by British Pate in 1934. We see Durano swinging Alexis by the hair, throwing her over his back onto his shoulders. She in turn knees him in the groin and kicks him in the stomach. He finally swings her around through the air by leg and arm before throwing her unconscious body over his shoulder and leaving. The dance is watched by group of extras, supposedly patrons at a Parisian cafe who look on, horrified. Thank you. 
So what happens at Muscle Beach is that Adagio is reinvented by endless combinations of gendered bodies, reframing what was most famously a representation of sexual violence by a man towards a woman into a subtly queer practice. Harold Zinkin points to the spirit of invention. He likens acrobalance practice to a game. He said, quote, there'd be a little bit of a line taking turns doing whatever we wanted until we were tired. We'd bounce off what other people were doing or put combinations of things together. So you already had a game. You saw good things happening from people you didn't know, end quote. So this activity is virtuosic in both of the sense of being exceptionally skilled, but also in Paolo Virno's sense of a form of labor that is also its own fulfillment. Um, however, while for Virno, virtuosity is characteristic of a post-Fordist form of immaterial labor and thus exploitable by what Luke Botansky and Yves Chiappello call the new spirit of capitalism, the Muscle Beach participants' own reflections suggest another uh, kind of reading of this practice closer to what Virno analyzes as idle talk. Derided as useless chatter, idle talk, Virno says, is actually communication whose, quote, lack of foundation authorizes invention and the experimentation of new discourses. Instead of reflecting that which exists, it produces states of things, unedited experiences, new facts, end quote. So in this extended summer holiday, Muscle Beach can be seen as a corporeal idle talk. It's chatter and noise between bodies where new relations and ways of organizing emerge. Uh, Zinkin says, everybody shared whatever they had without hesitation, and you do it. End quote. So what seemed to emerge was a negation of the self in favor of collective experience. Zinkin later wrote, Quote, I remember how magically as participants we became close as one body, each of us giving up any independent role we originally felt. Quote. In 1998, Pudgy Stockton recorded a videotaped interview and she describes performing a high hand-to-hand -hand balance, a trick in which the bass holds a flyer in a handstand with outstretched arms. She performed this trick with a visiting vaudeville artist and she cannot remember the year. She says, he did a handstand in a high hand-to-hand -hand on me, and I tell you, it was just like, I can't describe it, it was just like it was part of me. As Pudgy says this, a smile crosses her face and her hands reach into the air. We see a pulse of energy as she gropes for the remembered lockout of the arms, remembering supporting this man in the air nearly 60 years earlier. The visiting artist had an act with a partner, and the interviewer, Jan Todd, asked Pudgy if she remembers their name, uh, names. Pudgy replies, oh no, I don't, I don't remember any of those names. Through the fog of memory, it's striking that Pudgy recalls the embodied experiences with such clarity and liveliness, even though the formal identities of the participants are long gone. In a sense, then, the physical practice of acrobalance, adagio, and hand balancing on Muscle Beach is a practice of heightened physical arousal, sustained and circulated by the bodies of these performers. So in summary, the precarious economy of the beach was sustained by economy of attention. They were performing for an audience of casual spectators um, whose faces are captured by the documentary, watching from the pier, eating ice cream, passing time. So the play of the Muscle Beach participants was consumed as spectacle, as work, by an impromptu audience on the pier. But at the same time, the attention of these non-paying spectators are in some ways inconsequential compared to the heightened physical experience of the practice itself, in which the body abdicates the self and becomes aroused to the presence of multiple others. And I think the documentary captures this too in the close-ups of the athletes' faces. They're clearly aware that their training was spectacle, but at the same time, they're not exactly performing for the audience, even when the audience is applauding. Harold Zinkin writes, the tricks we learned, invented, and dreamed about would be tried over and over again until we were able to hold a position for maybe a few seconds, maybe a minute. If we got a few claps, we figured it was a good trick. But the applause wasn't our motivation. It just told us we were making progress, end quote. So it's strange to call these Muscle Beach performers amateur when they clearly are the best at what they're doing. But their labor was indeed amateur in the truest sense, it's, which is to say sustained by love, or at the very least, pleasure. 
So I turned out to pleasure to think through this concept through the sexual terminology of foreplay um, in Julia Palladini's uh, terms. Um, so I'll start with this quotation from the Evening Outlook again. They wrote, uh, the Evening Outlook believes that our beaches should be kept for the use of decent people and not turned over to gymnastics exhibitions, which might be better held in private gymnasiums. <laughs> So this reference, I think, to decent people, not to mention the paper's obsession with perverts and sex criminals, which was their terms, um, turns, gymnasti turns gymnastics into a double entendre. The lines representative of supposedly sordid activities, which were always suspected of happening beneath this healthy all-American veneer of Muscle Beach, it was crystallized in Bud Clifton's 1958 pulp novel, Muscle Boy. So in this novel, a bodybuilding teenager, Jerry, gets caught up with a predatory homosexual photographer called Ray Peterson, who's supposed to be Bob Miser. Clifton hints at Muscle Beach's queer subculture. He writes, of course, Muscle Beach is a strip of Santa Monica, but it's also a country of its own. While the folklore may not be printable, there's a lot of it. <laughs> I love how these novels are written, the, the pulp style. It's, um, it's very beautiful. Um, the, the novel itself contains no actual sex. Uh, the perversion, or the queer subtext, comes from the narcissistic gaze of body worship. In other words, rather than taking the Evening Outlook's condemnation of gymnastics as innuendo, we should maybe take it at face value. To the average American during this time, there was something troubling about these young athletes working out their bodies at all and training together. And this queerness in plain sight might be understood through Palladini's concept of foreplay. So Palladini describes foreplay as a practice sustained by the pleasure of doing rather than economic value. She uses the term to account for performances sustained by a labor of pleasure on the part of performers and spectators and which exceed the frame of a singular event. Performances not according to a climax, but which develop in an extended interval of leisurely enjoyment within a complex economy of attention and distraction. Some forms of performance, she argues, demonstrate what she calls show idleness instead of show business. Uh, show idleness is an alternate temporality of performing, quote, capable of resisting its already, uh, always already forthcoming incorporation into capitalist production, end quote. Which is to say, the tarry, the wait, the delaying, the ultimate climax that makes a performance meaningful also brings it to an end. Palladini cites Tom Ian's experimental play, Why Hannah's Skirt Won't Stay Down, to illustrate this idle pleasure. In the play, uh, which takes place in Coney Island, <laughs> Hannah and Arizona, um, a boy and a girl, a girl and a boy, uh, pose and play for themselves. Hannah recreates Marilyn Monroe's famous scene over a sewer grate in The Seven Year Itch. Arizona flexes his muscles in the mise en abime of a carnival funhouse. Palladini writes, quote, Their labor of desire is self-accomplishing in its promise of entertainment and is self-consummating. They do not play for someone, although they might happen to be seen by someone while they're playing. End quote. At the end of the play, their playful leisure is incorporated into the attractions of the fun house. A carnival barker comes out and uh, barks for uh, Hannah and Arizona, as if, um, quote, the destiny of incorporation offered, in fact, no possibility of escape, end quote. But from this productive economy in which no more or less voluntarily they're exploited, Hannah and Arizona are also able to write their own narrative to broaden the space-time of their pleasure, so their idleness forms a queer intimacy between them. If we conceive of the performance of Muscle Beach not as individual acts that happen and are over, but rather as a long durée stretching from 1934 to 1958, returning every day to the same stretch of sand, then the gaze of the audience is really a glance. The eye of the audience comes across the act informally, it does not bestow value upon it, but it's not inconsequential either. The athletes and the audience form an aleatory, or by chance, theatrical economy whose unhurried temporality troubles the productive time of industrial capitalism. Like actors, the athlete's leisure, leisure or the act, athlete's labor, sorry, takes place in a space that, like the theater, is a space of leisure for the audience. But unlike actors whose work only appears to be play or leisure, the work of the Muscle Beach athletes really was a form of play. 
In this way, as Joseph Strick's film captures, the performance of Muscle Beach was, was spectacular, but it was strangely uneventful for the audience. So the arrangements of precarious bodies and hand balancing, posing, um, or lifting of increasingly heavier weights offers rising action but no climax. In hand balancing or adagio, for example, the only possibility of an ending is either the careful dismantling of the structure or it's falling to the ground. It constantly denies the audience catharsis. The audience is therefore pulled into a queer temporality of unhurried pleasures, watching a performance which never quite had a beginning and perhaps will never quite have an end. The decision then to return to one's space-time of factory and family to end the holiday was one's own, rather than dictated by the end of the performance. If no one returned the next day, it would still be there. I suggest that the athletes of Muscle Beach, performing the work of pleasure in a temporary utopia sustained by informal acts of mutual aid and sacrifice, might be a forgotten example of Nick Rideout's passionate amateur. Quote, those who work together for the production of value for one another, for love, that is, rather than money, in ways that refuse, sometimes and rather quietly, and perhaps even ineffectually, the division of labor which obtains under capitalism as usual. End quote. So for Nick Rideout, the, the amateur is someone who interrupts his or her work in order to make theater or make art, rather than making art his or her work. It's this in dialectical incorporation into the structures of capitalism which troubles those very structures. So, put more plainly, the amateur is defined because she acts in relation to what Marx calls the realm of necessity. So other people are doing things because they have to. So her, the amateur's activity is constantly defined in opposition either to the work of the pro professional who makes her living from theater or to the work that she herself does to make a living. The amateur is an amateur because she is not professional. But within that relation, quote, the amateur acts out of love in what Marx calls the realm of freedom, making an unconditional commitment that affirms its own autonomy, end quote. So these Muscle Beach athletes were caught in the realm of necessity, the possibilities of professional work in Hollywood or on stage, opening gyms and becoming instructors, military service, getting married and starting families, but yet, the athletes continue to return each day to the same beach um, in order to preserve their practice, their labor of pleasure for as long as possible. So this is why Muscle Beach has the quality of a utopia, however temporary. In the images of bodies preserved forever in motion, in the struggle and tension of the arms, legs, core, captured by Strix film, we see an effort to linger in the movement of the dialectic between chaos and formation, between flesh and not, singular coupled group. It's this labor of love that marks Muscle Beach as what Jose Esteban Munoz called a queer utopia, an alternative organization of social relations, quote, in the face of hopeless heteronormative maps of the present where futurity is indeed the province, province of normative reproduction. And even though it's long gone, its optimism can be seen from the landscape of the future. So a final um, postscript, I suppose, to this work. In truth, I didn't know about Muscle Beach um, until my first visit to the Stark Center at the University of Texas at Austin. I confused it with Venice Beach in my mind. <laughs> so these astonishing images of high-flying acrobatics, precarious hand balancing, adagio, and classically built bodies were revelatory. They were so clearly influential to our ideas of health and fitness, and yet they were mainly forgotten. What was more striking was the personal quality to the archive. These were Pudgy and Les Stockton's papers. Their correspondence was neatly organized, but it was also filed under weird categories like meatball, screwball, and ego. Postcards from famous friends were either lovingly saved, um, and uh, one of the George Eiferman um, on a trip to, uh, trip to Europe writes, uh, this place, uh, and he's writing from London, says, this place is pretty much like California, either it's cloudy or drizzling, never misses. <laughs> um, and Pudgy Stockton's own spidery hand or typewritten captions ran throughout the files and folders, the work of an amateur archivist, um, archivist organizing her own life and memories, rather, her family history. For what the photo binders, scrapbooks, and clippings most represented was a family album or a genealogy project. This is um, Les and Pudgy Stockton. 
In one sense, they had a normative family life. Pudgy started dating Les when she was a senior in high school and he a freshman at UCLA. They married seven years later in 1941. In 1953, they had a daughter, Laura Jean. But in another sense, Pudgy's family papers uh, preserve something more queerly expansive. Rather than the couple form, what we see preserved is open and multiple connections to others, in particular Bruce Connors, with whom Les had formed a hand balancing act at UCLA. Once Muscle Beach had been established, Pudgy, Les, and Bruce expanded the two man balancing act into three, made public appearances as the three aces. We see this running through the captions Pudgy, Les, and Bruce, Bruce, Legend, Puzzy, Pudgy, Les, Bruce, and Pudgy. Three expands into five. When Sunbeam and Wayne Long joined, it became Pudgy and her boys. Just like the bodies organize themselves into a multiplicity of combinations and formations beyond, beyond the hetero and homonormative couple, so do the names and captions. Even as the names, um, sorry, um, even as the names fade from memory, the embodied experience remains. On a photo of Pudgy holding Bruce in a high hand to hand, she captions the back, both are completely locked out for a change. Ha! In the late 1990s, Terry and Jan Todd, the founders and directors of the Stark Center, set out to capture oral history interviews with many of the original Muscle Beach players, including Pudgy Stockton, Relman Brewer McCray, Steve Reeves, Russ Saunders, Glenn Sunby, Armin Tanny, Harold Zinkin, and George Eiferman. As interviewers, the Todds are legends of the Iron Games themselves. Terry became the first man to squat over 700 pounds in competition in 1965. Jan was called the strongest woman in the world by Sports Illustrated during her powerlifting career. This means that they are far from detached scholarly voices. Rather, they dialogue with their subjects, swapping stories, connecting through shared embodied knowledge of physical culture. During her interview with Pudgy, for instance, Jan describes going with her father to the Museum of Natural History in Chicago and beating him on a test your strength machine. And she's about 11 years old in this, in this story. Um, Jan says, he was astonished and I think I was actually pretty embarrassed by it. Pudgy laughs and says, you never want to be different than the rest of the people. Jan says, no, all my life I want to be a petite, small person, but I think because I was naturally strong, that's maybe why the lifting worked so well for me. What the viewer feels watching these tapes is that the Todd's aim is not only to collect and preserve the facts of physical, physical culture, what actually happened, but to preserve the way this history was lived, practiced, and felt in the body, how embodied practice created friendships and relationships. I was constantly surprised during my time there how many figures in the Stark Center archives the Todd's had known personally, connected by a shared place in physical culture history. During my time at the University of Texas at Austin, I passed afternoons listening to Jan's stories of meeting George Hackenschmidt's wife, Rachel, or Terry's recollections of Bruno Sammartino, the wrestler and powerlifter who passed away during one of my visits to the Stark Center. I was moved by the way the Todd's welcomed me into what still felt like a living history because I, as a weightlifter, albeit one late to the game, lived my research. From my conversations with the Todd's, I began to learn that physical culture and strength, which I had always been intimidated by, was not incompatible with kindness and empathy, but indeed, the process of building it could be linked to the start of opening oneself out to the world. I learned that muscle building need not only be linked to vanity or hegemonic masculinity, but simply be a means of, as Jan put it, enriching your life. I spent my days flipping through archives, hearing these stories, and then in the sweltering late afternoon Texas sun, I would ride my bike over to Hyde Park Gym on Guadalupe Street and spend more hours communing with the barbell and plates, putting my body into patterns of movement and gestures that hundreds of men and women had invented and perfected for me. I was a visitor to that gym, but the Hyde Park weightlifters welcomed me into this family, sharing equipment and knowledge, and we would relate through acts of correction that felt like care. Stay over the bar more, bring your hips through, not here, here. And then I would ride back home to my rented backyard casita, I would eat tacos, sit on the porch, write, writing or watching Netflix in the dying light. And this temporary utopia of Muscle Beach, this Texas holiday, this labor of pleasure, would come to an end. 
this time upon my return to London and setting down these embodied experiences in the form of a book. On July 7, 2018, Terry Todd died at the age of 80. A man who devoted his life to physical culture and its history passed into that history. Writing this now, any attempt to pay tribute to his accomplishments and legacy seems inadequate to what has already been said. But what I can offer is what my friendship with Terry and Jan has taught me. History is not comprised of faded documents and photographs, but is a story of living bodies. Our responsibility as researchers of physical culture, and this goes for theater and performance too, should not be scholarly detachment, but to approach our subject alive to those other possibilities, narratives, relations, and ways of living that are contained in embodied practice. And this is uh, Jan Todd with Pudgy Stockton at her apartment in Santa Monica. It is Saturday, June, excuse me, May 16th, 1998. Um, Pudgy, what I wonder if you would, if it's a way to start, if you could just talk a little bit about the early days and how you got started mm -hmm. and just sort of tell us that story and then we'll wander on from there. <laughs> High school, uh, I started to gain weight very rapidly because I wasn't exercising. And I went had started working with a telephone company, so you're sitting. Okay. And, uh, yeah. 